The first experience I had, I was working with a very small rocket with a one eighth inch uh, orifice exit. And uh, I have a picture of it. It was published in the Welding Journal, May 1956, which shows me holding one of these gadgets in my hand and sticking in hand controlled, I think it was just a piece of, uh, just a wire of, of mild steel. And that's my first experience with thermal spray. Uh, from then, I didn't have uh, much to do with it. Uh, I had a contract with Mogul, an outfit in uh, Chicago to uh, develop a, uh, a wire sprayer using a rocket. I worked several months on that and it didn't go very well and they weren't impressed and that was the end of that. I didn't really pick it up again until uh, several years later. After spending three years at the Lindy Labs in Tonawanda, New York, which is now Praxair, I left and started teaching engineering at Dartmouth and served as his assistant dean. Thus began my business partnership with Jim Browning. I had met Jim before. He was one of my engineering instructors and senior person on a government research program that employed me in 1952. With the engineering school as a base and the myriad of its facilities free to use, we started our consulting and research business. The company was soon named Thermal Dynamics. One of our contacts was Herb Ingham, Vice President of METCO. At the time, I believe their sales were about seven million annually. METCO's primary product was the wire gas gun, and I believe they were just introducing their first P powder gun. I didn't know anything about thermal spraying, but did know a lot about flames. Herb asked me to submit a proposal, and I gave him two. The first involved obtaining a better understanding of liquid metal droplet formation. The second involved looking at a new technology, plasma, as a heat source for thermal spraying. He said, pick the one you'd like to work on. And serendipitously, I chose plasma. The rest is history. Around 1955, uh, I collected a couple of assistants and started a small company that was uh, uh, doing high temperature work. We worked on engines and things like that, detonation processes. And I had a call from uh, METCO, from uh, Ray Axline and uh, Herb Bingham. They said they were having uh, trouble with their flame spray unit vis-a-vis -vis the new D-gun, the detonation gun, for spraying of tungsten carbide cobalt. Their coatings just simply weren't as good and, uh, as the D-gun and they said, we think maybe uh, uh, some higher temperature thing like plasma that we hear you've been working on might melt the uh, material and uh, make us competitive again. Uh, and they sponsored all of our early work in plasma spraying, uh, which led uh, to uh, their own torch a couple of years later. I've forgotten what the number of it was. And that work was done by Merle Thorpe, who had been a student of mine, had worked at Union Carbide, and came back uh, when I started uh, this small research outfit. My effort involved an intensive year understanding cathode and anode designs and materials to achieve 25-hour electrode life with nitrogen. Then I developed a prototype torch for spraying wires and a second which produced a plasma flame into which powder could be injected. Herb Ingham, in a program review, picked the powder torch. Over a span of 15 months, we were able to spray most carbides and ceramics. In 1957, we were about to introduce our first 40 kilowatt called the F40 torch for sale for applications other than spraying. Our plans were interrupted by an announcement that Plasmadyne was offering a plasma spray torch for sale. We had an internal strategy session, and since METCO had no experience with plasma, it was decided that Thermal Dynamics should immediately market a multipurpose torch to minimize any inroads that Plasmadyne might make. I developed the literature, wrote articles, sent out numerous new product releases. We were immediately successful, and orders flooded in, about 100 the first year. After about two years of our selling the F40, 
Metco decided they were ready to take over sales related to flame spray. It was about two years after that, and Merle had done the work that developed this, and also he had developed uh, a general purpose plasma system. We found that we could get a lot of orders for re-entry and material studies of uh, uh, satellites. They call them satellites, not missiles in those days. And uh, <clears throat> we developed equipment for work in wind tunnels, worked at very high pressures, all the way to vacuum pressures. And we made the largest one we made was, was seven megawatts at 7,000 kilowatts, which is quite a bit uh, larger than uh, any spray torch. And uh, that's about the history of it. Uh, two years later, in 1958, Thermal Dynamics was formed. And uh, we in Plasmadyne were about the only companies in the United States that were making non-transferred plasma apparatus. We went into that business and sold quite a few uh, units that worked at over 1,000 kilowatts. They worked up to 100 atmospheres, and they worked down uh, issuing into uh, uh, vacuum chambers. I remember one of them had an exit diameter of about one foot. Union Carbide then came out with a plasma cutting torch. And looking at that torch, uh, I figured I'd work on that to try to make it better, to be able to lower the cost of the from argon to nitrogen and things like that. And I started working on that. And that was my technical responsibility. Merle, on the other hand, uh, felt uh, quite a loyalty for the outfit that treated him so well. He worked there several years. And uh, uh, he was the one then to take over the responsibility for thermal spraying in the METCO program. And he developed a non-transferred torch of excellent uh, operating qualities that was useful for very many different things. The arrangement we had with METCO that they had all the rights to any patents that issued uh, for metal spraying and that we would have the rights to the same patents for other applications including cutting. In the late 70s, the federal government came out with a small business innovation program, SBIRs, and I applied for one. I was one of the first to apply, and I thought a good area might be to go after the D-gun with a steady state device and develop a unit that could be held in your hand. I got the picture of it here. If you, I don't know if you can see it or not. It was an early, early experimental thing that made the cover of uh, Ink Magazine. Uh, this sponsorship was very important to us. Uh, I brought Dick Whitfield into the business at the time, and uh, the first uh, unit was the Jet Coat, which we licensed to uh, Cabot Corporation. And then we developed a, what we called the J-Gun, which was then uh, subsequently licensed uh, to, uh, to Tafa. So <laughs> the circle is sort of closed with, with, with Merle Thorpe. Uh, the gun was quite successful, these guns, and I said, well, maybe for some purposes uh, it's too hot, but maybe if we made a compressed air burner like the ones we're using in the quarry, we had several hundred of them in use, actually. Some quarries like Rock of Ages had seven of them. Uh, <coughs> what would happen if we used that? It might be a less expensive way to spray these things. Well, I was working in, in the lab, and I asked my assistant uh, to turn on the, the powder. Well, he said, what do you mean turn the powder on? It's been on for five minutes. And I was amazed. I looked at the workpiece, and the workpiece glowed, but you couldn't see anything between the, the burner and the workpiece. I think it was tungsten carbide cobalt that we were spraying. And it suddenly hit me that these particles were hitting solid, and that... Uh, they were fusing upon impact, and I called it uh, uh, solid impact. I had never heard of, of uh, cold spray at the time. So we uh, followed that and came up with a patent on 
uh, Impact Fusion, which uh, is now licensed to both uh, TAFA and to METCO who are competing in the field. was, why at your age are you still working in this field? The answer is simple, I, I enjoy it very much. I'm working alone, I do my own machining, I do my own testing. And I said, if I want to stay in this business, I have to make the 8VOF system much simpler and apply it to wire spraying. And uh, by luck or uh, other means, I have been able to develop a wire spray gun <coughs> which is HVOF. This is the HVOF tube. It weighs three ounces. This is the wire. It's a one-eighth inch aluminum, and it sprays beautifully. And I'm uh, hopeful that uh, the industry will be able to use this uh, soon. But why can't a nanoparticle small enough be accelerated by uh, uh, electro uh, dynamic means, magnetic means, much as the uh, atomic particles are accelerated. If that could happen, then this could be done in a vacuum, the coatings would be done in a vacuum, and the particles would hit with tremendous energy against the flat surfaces, but of course not enough energy that it makes a hole through the <laughs> device. Thanks again. <coughs> I think I know a lot about rocket burners and came up with the uh, statement, I know a great deal about next to nothing. And that applies to thermal spray. I apologize for that. Nothing beats working hard on interesting things. Being at the right place at the right time, recognizing it, and being your own boss. It was a great run. I made a lot of friends, participated in many breakthroughs, and look forward to going to work every day. What more could one ask?